Hmm. Something's definitely got their attention this morning. And all my birds seem like they're over there. Today's video is sponsored by BetterHelp. I feel like I need to go out there and see what's going on, but I did have something I wanted to talk to you guys about today. You see, I feel like we are in the middle of undergoing yet another shift in our society and kind of like the overall landscape of the world. And while this may seem like a new and different and scary thing, it actually also feels like something that's happened to us as a culture and society before, only in a slightly different way. Because the way I see it, there is a distinct similarity between the mechanization of agriculture that took place at the beginning of the 20th century and the shift that we're gonna see in the next couple of years with the impact of artificial intelligence and what it's gonna do for a whole bunch of different industries. Hey dogs, what's got your attention? You seem very very excited about whatever's going on back there, huh? What is it, Abby Dog? You were like on the hunt. Is there some sort of creature over there in the woods? Yeah. What about you, Toby Dog? You seem highly energized as well. I wonder what that could be. Well, if we're gonna check it out, we gotta go this way. You see, in the last couple of days, I've totally changed up sort of how my animals are living and that the birds, or at least all the ducks and geese, have moved out of the hoop coop, which is where they were living all winter. And they're now living out here in this pasture. Like you can actually see we got a duck who's nesting right here in these tall grasses. But actually the vast majority of our flock is right over here. And I installed this temporary doggy door and human gate so that I could get in and out and the dogs could actually still guard up in this area. But pretty much for this entire summer, these birds are gonna be grazing in the upper portion of our permaculture orchard. Oh. Abby and Toby just took off again. Something's got their attention out there. But yeah, it's actually by design, you know. They free range around this farm and particularly in this pasture, keeping the birds safe. Of course, this whole setup makes finding duck eggs a little trickier than usual. This one's definitely fresh. So back in 1900, roughly 40% of Americans were employed in agriculture in some way, shape, or form. But then if you fast forward about 100 years later to the year 2000, what you're gonna find is less than 2% of Americans were employed in agriculture. Now that's a pretty dramatic shift of the workforce of America and what people were spending their time doing and how they were earning their livings. But I feel like that's only part of the story. You see, because when a lot of people often romanticize in a Wendell Berry kind of way the agrarian nature of America past, they often picture people having farms. Like all 40% of those people who were working in agriculture in 1900 had like some sort of farm in some way, shape or form. And that we were like just some sort of society completely dotted and covered in small farms here in America. But that's not true. Most of those folks who were working in agriculture in 1900, they were either day laborers or tenant farmers or sharecroppers of some sort. They weren't the people who owned the land. They were the people who worked the land and the actual farm owners at that time were still a relatively tiny fraction of the overall population of people who worked in agriculture. But when the tractor started to arrive in prominence in the 20th century, not to say that it didn't exist in the 1800s, but it really wasn't until the 20th century that you had the rise of the tractor. That's when you ultimately had this massive shift to the mechanization of farming and the tractor playing a massive role in how farms were run. And that's also where you get that precipitous drop off in the number of Americans actually working on farms. I don't know, it was through there that the dogs were really barking but as I look out there right now, I don't see anything, so I think all's clear. Abby seems much more interested in looking at our heifer calves here in the pasture, and Toby Dog's gone down that away, so it doesn't seem like there's an urgent threat right now. And while I feel like a lot of the myth and story of our farming history often goes that it was the tractor that gave rise to big farm and big ag industry, but I think you also have to recognize that it was those farm owners who really supported the idea of that ag industry because they were the ones who were saying, hey, we're sick of having to pay all these workers, having all this paid labor, which if we're talking about 1900, remember if you look about 50 years earlier than that, there was a large fraction of the agricultural population who was unpaid, but those farm owners were the ones who really pushed for mechanization because it meant that they had to hire less people, which meant that they could maybe become more profitable. And I would argue that that, my friends, is the idea that really sparked the tractor revolution of the 1900s. As you guys know in past videos, I've talked a lot about my mental health and how important I believe therapy is in really helping you try to directly address your problems. I did wanna take a moment to address something important related to today's video sponsor, BetterHelp. 
I really believe that therapy is an important tool to help you dive in and understand the roots of your behaviors and help you find a way to make yourself better. And that is why I'm such a big fan of BetterHelp. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service and it's 100% online. Sometimes finding a therapist that you can meet with face to face is nearly impossible for some folks. I mean, look at me, I'm a guy living in the middle of nowhere in Vermont. If I were to be looking for therapists locally here, it'd be a roughly 45 minute to an hour drive to find folks who deal with the issues that I wanted to deal with. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of more than 30,000 therapy professionals professionals who are all licensed with a lot of experience who have a lot of different specialties. The way it works is you go on the BetterHelp website, you answer a few questions, and they start to give you some options of therapists that you can work with. That breadth of available therapists makes it easy to find the match that's right for you. And you can even test somebody out, and if you don't feel like they're right for you, it's not too hard to find a new therapist too, all through BetterHelp. And then once you're matched with somebody, you can talk to them either through video chat, or phone, or text. There's a variety of options available to communicate the way you want to communicate. If you want to test out BetterHelp yourself, there's a link down below, and if you use that special link, you can actually get 10% off your first month. So give it a try. That's betterhelp.com slash goldshaw farm. And remember, that's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P. I'm also gonna use my tractor to move my mobile chicken coop up to the upper pasture with the cattle. Well, that'll be probably in the next couple of days. First, I've also gotta use my tractor to do some clean out of the hoop coop because there's a whole heck of a lot of just litter and compost and bedding that was built up from the winter. You know, sometimes I watch these videos while I'm editing and say, gosh darn it, I should have said something like, there's a whole bunch of poop in the hoop coop and I gotta clean out all the hoop coop poop. But instead, I missed that opportunity, and now I'm cursing myself while I edit this video. Okay, back to the show. And as I do all of this work here on the farm, I recognize just how important and crucial having tools like a tractor are for me as a sole farm operator to be able to manage everything here. And the reality is, whenever you're a business owner, you're always looking at ways to save time and money and cut your costs and reduce your expenses and increase your profit margins. And that, in my mind, gets to the real dilemma that exists. Because if I put myself in the shoes of the farmers of the 1900s, I understand why they decided to stop using hand labor, started to actually bring on more mechanization, why they made that shift. It makes perfect sense, and I feel like I'm doing a lot of it here today. And while my constraints might be different, but the reality is, for me, hiring labor is tricky on a couple of fronts. On one end, it's just like a whole other thing I have to manage and I didn't really move into farming because I wanted to be managing people. In my previous career I spent a lot more time managing people and it was not exactly what I wanted to do most of the time. But then on the other end if I try to think about the labor market right now here in the Northeast Kingdom there is this dilemma that even if I was paying like $25, $30 an hour it's actually hard to hire folks who can reliably come here and work on the farm. And some of you might say well then your wages are too low you should be paying more. But the problem is if I look at like what I'm charging for say eggs or meat, my prices are already relatively high. You know, somebody's gonna maybe pay $20 a pound for some good steak from our farm. I don't think they would pay $40 per pound. And so it doesn't make it financially viable to bring on an employee at a certain price when it drives your price up so much that it ultimately makes it hard to sell that product in the marketplace. Which is why then you ultimately start to look at labor saving devices and contraptions as a way to cut your operating costs and make your farm somehow financially viable. And yes, I say all of this recognizing too that I have the tremendous privilege of the fact that even though we do earn money from our farm, it's not my sole income and what comes from making these videos actually really is what pays the bills. Hey goosey girl. So this is our last goose in this house. She just recently started sitting on this clutch of eggs and I think I'm gonna let her keep them and try to hatch out some eggs. She's a really good mother goose and so she's hanging back here with our chickens. Hey Blank Francis, who like I said, are gonna still be spending some time down here for the next few days. How are you doing girls? Making some eggs yet? Oh yeah, we got some here to collect today. All right, you guys still have plenty of food. Maybe because there's actually two parts to my farm business that I spend so much time thinking about this stuff. Good morning, little bees. But the reality is, the revolution that's kind of going on right now when it comes to things like artificial intelligence, it very much feels like it's paralleling 
what happened with agriculture and the tractor about 100, 120 years ago. Yeah, the bees are just waking up this morning. I just installed the bees in here, gosh, I don't know, four days ago, five days ago? So far, so good. Dogs and cats are a little bit curious about the whole thing. I actually have two other active hives down over on another part of this pasture, but I decided to install this flow hive, which is kind of new for me and something that I'm just testing out right here in a very central part of the farm. Because this year I want to do a better job of watching my bees very, very closely. But I digress. So when it comes to artificial intelligence though, there's been all sorts of new tools in the last, I don't know, year plus, maybe two years, between artificial intelligence image generation, between generative content type tools like ChatGPT, to tools like the fact that I can now make fake people say fake things. Please don't make this yet another video where a lazy and greedy content creator tries to justify using artificial intelligence. And while all of those tools are kind of nifty and interesting, I also do think it's important to say that you shouldn't necessarily be rushing headlong into using them without thinking about the consequences of what happens with them. All right, we're gonna now turn on the watering system that's going to get all the water to all my cattle plus all my ducks and geese these days up, then turn this switch down here and that way i can send all the water thousands of feet up the hill to where the cattle are having a system built like this which uses mechanization as a way to get water to my animals is really important because if I didn't, I would probably spend, I don't know, two hours a day watering my animals versus these days to water every single animal on our farm, it takes me, I don't know, seven minutes maybe. And even in those seven minutes, I can do other things while the water's pumping. Like check in on my adorable baby goose legs. Hey guys. How's everybody doing under there? Yes, we have the gooselings of two different sizes. We have these guys who are, I don't know, two and a half weeks old, and then there's some of the little guys still who are, I don't know, like six days old, I think. The funny thing is, even though there's two of these, they like to crowd under one altogether. Yeah, I'm gonna probably have to come in here later today and give this a cleaning. We got another batch of goslings hatching, I think, tomorrow. Oh, and they definitely want their food. Don't worry, gooselings, the big scary giant just coming to give you more food. Morning, girls. How's it going? All right, yep, it's your favorite time of day. Come on. They love their feeding time. And unfortunately today, I just ran out of brewer's grain. So they're getting some hog feeder, as well as some cracked corn, as well as just some kitchen scraps, like old salad and a couple stale bread rolls and that sort of thing. The pigs are the ultimate composters on our farm. Okay, hang on. All right, here you go. Oh yeah, you gotta get all the way in there to really enjoy that stuff, don't you? Oop. I'm sorry, Phil. I didn't mean to bump you in the bum. You know, I think when it comes down to it, I'm still trying to figure out the role that artificial intelligence plays with our farm as well as the videos that I make about our farm. You know, in the past couple months, I've experimented with using artificial intelligence to say, ask viewer questions. I've used it to design video thumbnails and probably my most favorite use for it is deploying it as a way to come up with new and interesting jokes for the videos. Like for example, I don't think I'd ever be able to commission an artist to draw all of my pigs as sopranos as quickly as I could by just asking a computer to do it. But that's not to say that all of this doesn't come with its own ethical squishiness that does need to be addressed. Abby, I want you to stay here. Toby Dog, can you come with me? Toby, come. Good girl, Abby. Good girl. Time for Mr. Toby Dog's special feeding time. Oh, I know. Here you go, pal. Yeah, based on some feedback from viewers and suggestions, I started giving Toby just his own special time to eat as well as get some positive affirmations from me. But that doesn't mean that Lady Abington gets ignored. You get your own special time, right, sweetie? See, a 50 pound mineral block like this is really hard to carry on a bike. And uh, actually this time of year, this is the only other thing other than water and grass that I give my cattle. It just gives them some extra minerals that they need to thrive. Ooh. But yes, when it comes to artificial intelligence and using it, I have been, you know, 
cautiously experimenting and exploring would be the way I'd consider how I've been using it. There's some tools and resources that'll save me time in terms of how long it takes to edit a video. There's some tools and resources where I think I can make my videos better and in ways that I would never be able to do if I was just trying to hire like a conventional artist or something just because of the amount of time and direction that it takes versus me just using a tool like Mid Journey. That's the trade-off. But then as I've been doing other things, like for example, working on finalizing my new book about Toby Dog, that was something that I felt like it was really important to have an artist's touch and like that human feel and perspective in and so that's why you see me working with an illustrator in that scenario but by no means do i have all of this figured out and at the same time i realize that if i don't start experimenting and exploring i feel like i could be left behind or miss opportunities and so yes you see me cautiously experimenting with artificial intelligence tools much like if i was a farmer say in 1900 you'd probably see me starting to think about doing away with my horses and moving to a tractor the reality is so much of this stuff is not black and white and there's just an awful lot of shades of gray involved and in how you need to think about these things. Do you look at the Wonder Twins here? Just rubbing up against my fence trying to de-shedify yourself. I know you miss your moms who are over there and pretty soon you guys are going to be starting to graze down the hill and they're going to head that away and you guys are going to get separated. But don't worry Belinda, I'll still be visiting you every single day. Now I don't think I'm going to move the cattle this morning because you can see they still have plenty of grass and good grass and good things too like vetch that they haven't eaten yet so I'll let them stay in this grazing cell just a little bit longer and probably this afternoon move them to the next one. And that's a judgment as me as the human farmer I'm making versus say using some sort of artificial intelligence algorithm to make that decision and i think at the crux of it that's where i feel like it's a balance you know there are some really awful things that have happened with modern agriculture as a result of big ag and mechanization where the farm business model is arguably not nearly as sustainable as it was say 100 120 years ago and really the death of the small and diversified farm it came at the arrival of the big heavy tractor and what came there Did you look at this see how she's shedding See, this is like that undercoat. And Ariel here is one of the few cows that'll let me brush her. When I start to look at Amanda Hugging Kiss's coat or Annabelle's coat, you can see there's just large clumps that I haven't been able to get out. Let me see if she'll let me grab one. Whoop. Nope, she does not like to be touched. And I should respect that. Yes, meanwhile, Ariel doesn't mind. And so I can come in here and get her cleaned up a little bit more. And in my opinion, that's the bigger shame of the rise of the tractor and, and what's happened because it's not so much the fact that, yeah, my farm now relies on fossil fuels or that I don't have a team of eight people helping me here on the farm that I think is the sad part. It's recognizing that farmers no longer treat their farms like ecosystems because there's so much focus on inputs, outputs, and production. And if you're just thinking of those three dimensions, thinking about how, say, your dog interacts with your birds or how the cattle interact with the insect life, like those types of things stop mattering nearly as much when you're just focused on keeping your tractor running and keeping things going around the farm. I think the other thing that really happened when you had that shift to mechanization in agriculture is rural communities, and particularly like rural communities like the one that I live in right here, right now, their ecosystems were absolutely decimated by the tractor. And I don't think people talk about this enough, right? Where the majority of the jobs, say in a town like Peacham, Vermont, which is where I live, were back in the day in the dairy industry. And even on a relatively small hill farm like ours, they probably had four or five other people other than the Shaws living and working on this farm, helping keeping things running. And they were participating in the community here. And even if you look at census records, right? If you go back 150 years ago, Peachum was still around 700, 750 people just like it is today. The reality though is that people here now are mostly like retirees and that comes from the fact that there just isn't a lot of industry in this area. And while the remote work shift of the last couple of years has brought more people in, it still hasn't quite replaced what would happen when you had all the workers here working on farms. And so if you're thinking about this community as an ecosystem, when you pull out that one resource of jobs that people were working and you put in a new thing like a tractor, which is eliminating those resources, it throws the whole ecosystem out of whack. Which if I'm going to put a finer point on this long and rambling rant, I guess I would say as we're thinking about artificial intelligence and its impact, we also need to be thinking about what that does to the ecosystem. What does that do for the people whose jobs are eliminated? How 
do you think about helping people adapt and shift within that changing landscape? That to me feels like the very, very important conversation that we're not having because we're too busy debating just the ethics of using artificial intelligence or not. I think the idea of not is going to fall by the wayside very quickly. Much like using human hands and draft horses went away with managing the land here. I just think the really important and responsible thing we're gonna all need to be focused on is how do we keep that stuff in balance? The idea that this new force has been entered into the ecosystem is just a fact and is not something that's gonna go away. It's how do we make sure that it doesn't throw everything out of whack. That's the thing we need to be focused on. And by the way, speaking of another thing we need to be focused on here, these fence clips are the coolest thing ever. So this actually connects to my fencing reel and it has this piece of metal in it and it runs from here all the way down here to where I tie my fencing wire on. And so what's nice is because this high tensile line is electrified, I can just clip it like this and now my entire fence is electrified. But then if I use the inner plastic side and clip it like that, it's not electrified and I can touch it all I want and I won't get zapped. I don't know, you guys might think that that's just obvious, but I think it's awesome. I'm still not quite ready to keep Abby up here full time, but she's spending more and more time up here and she seems really happy about it all. Come on, sweetie, we're gonna go back down to the pasture and you can eat your breakfast, okay? Hey, macho man, come on over here, buddy. Got a surprise for you. Come on, buddy, I got a surprise for you today. I know, you love that green grass. Let's go, buddy. Come on. You're gonna be doing lawnmower duty today. So yes, I could easily have a weed whacker lawnmower combination clean up this whole area here, particularly this whole area today. But I decided to set up a temporary paddock fence. And yes, Macho Man, you get all the grazing your little heart can desire. And no, Joey Ramon doesn't get to participate in this field trip because I can't trust him not to try to wander off. Yeah, buddy, I'm talking about you. So yes, I could have very easily gone to mechanization to clear this out, but I'm relying on animals instead. And I think if I was gonna say, what's the solution when it comes to the tractor problem? It's probably having a combination of the two and being balanced. And then if I were to say, what's the solution when it comes to artificial intelligence? It's probably that same idea. Focus on creating balance in the ecosystem.